الحمد لله رب العالمين الصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم I would like to uh, welcome you all to ICNA Dawa Conference 2020 Islam the, the solution in times of confusion um, Inshallah we have uh, I will be your host for the session uh, titled the golden ticket and we have an amazing lineup of speakers Inshallah uh, we will be moving on to uh, the Q&A session with uh, all three speakers of this session. Inshallah, I will dig right into the, the questions. Um, Imam Khalid, uh, the first question is for you. Uh, what are some ways individuals and institutions can support incarcerated Muslims? I know that you've been working very hard, uh, diligently on the Muslim prisoner support project. So if you want to shed some light on that as well, Inshallah. Uh, you're on mute, I think, Imam Khalid. You would think after a few webinars, I would sort of get that. <laughs> okay. Uh, yes, it, it's, it's very important that we try to identify ways in which we can concretely help those who are incarcerated. The Muslim Prisoner Support Project is a, is a project of the ICNA Council for Social Justice. And this is a project where we solicit funds and donations from the general Muslim community. And with those funds, we supply prayer rugs and books. Um, we have a group of khatibs who go to institutions. And right now it's mostly taking place in the DMV area, which is district Maryland and Virginia area. And we hope to expand this uh, across the country. And it's a, been amazing to me uh, some of the denials uh, that uh, Muslim inmates are getting in 2020. Uh, a lot of these battles were fought back in the 70s, but uh, just having Salat al Juma or being able to pray in a group or uh, have meals at appropriate times during Ramadan. So they need this kind of intervention. I would also like to just point out um, an effort that I've just become uh, recently become aware of, and it's called Believers Bailout. Uh, and this is a project where uh, the group uh, with Believers Bailout provide funds for cash bail, which is another very oppressive system where people are sitting in jail, haven't been convicted of anything, uh, and some of them very minor misdemeanors, but they may not have money to get out. Uh, so these are two projects. I mean, there are many going on across the country, uh, but I'll just point these two out right now. Um, Dr. Ingrid Madsen, um, I have a question for you. So as we all know that, you know, COVID-19 posed a threat to many on-campus events that, you know, were usually the showcase of our MSAs, Islam Awareness Week, Dawa Boots, Hijab Days. Uh, with many universities transitioning to an online or a hybrid model, model at least, what are some ways MSAs can still continue to engage with the non-Muslim student population? Yeah, uh, this is one of the um, reasons I was talking about prayer as well. Uh, and, uh, you know, whether, whether it's now or at other times, the question is, what are people lacking in their life? You know, my, my view is that, and what I see is that many people are very lonely, they're isolated, they're disconnected. Uh, they have a lot of anxiety. Um, I see students on campus just really overwhelmed with anxiety and fear, not only about the, less about this uh, illness, at least when it affects them, but it may affect their family, but even their future, you know, what's gonna happen? Are there gonna be any jobs when they get out of university? I mean, there are just a lot of unknowns. And so I, I believe that the best thing that we can share with others is how, what what gives us a sense of sakina what gives us a sense of of calm and comfort in times that are very difficult and this is really the best way to share what we know about allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the the creator who is has all of this creation um, under Allah's command, 
that we are not, we never have, you know, we, there's an illusion of control in our life. And so we should never feel like, oh, I used to be in control of things and now, now I don't have control. No, we, we never truly have control. And so rather than having a loss in that, we simply have become aware now. So what does it mean? This is why we turn to the one who does, who does control the universe, the one who does give life and then takes life. So I think the, the more through our you know online programming, we can share those narratives. I, I believe that when we share our our stories, when we share our strengths, when we share um, and demonstrate our resilience in times like this, this is the thing that that will attract people. They will see that that this religion really does does affect people in a positive way and gives them the strength, no matter what the circumstances are, to collectively go go forward. Of course, some of us are weak in times, but that's why we have this community. So to show the benefit of community. I was listening to a, there was a radio program. Some of you, many of you probably, at least in North America, have heard the program Radio Lab. And they, they had a program on the other night where they did an experiment. They just sent out a tweet and said, hey, if anyone's awake, can't sleep, here's a number to call. And it was amazing, like within one hour, all of these people were talking about, you know, called them and said, I can't sleep. I'm worried about this, 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 this. It shows you the concern. People are really worried. So what if Muslims on campus opened up, you know, just for those on campus, you have to do it in a secure way so you don't get random, like people crashing it, but said, you know, hey, tonight, for those who are, are going to be sleepless, we have this time where you can come and like ask for, ask for a prayer, ask for, you know, just share your concerns and we're here to support you. That is what Islam is. Islam is the embodiment of compassion. So I want to see a lot more creativity in really focusing on what Islam gives us in terms of our, our spiritual resilience and our ability to live through these difficult times. Dr. Madsen. Um, I have a question in the next for uh, Imam Shabir Ali. Uh, you know, Alhamdulillah, and you know, I pray that a lot of Muslim professionals, they already do da'wah by character, by action at their, at their jobs. But sometimes they hesitate to actively engage in a direct conversation pertaining to Islam. So what would you recommend, uh, you know, professional Muslims address? How do, they, how do they address this in terms of time, place, language, relationship? Yeah, yeah. I think place is an important component of this. And uh, in the lecture itself, I gave the impression that you can give dawah in your workplace. Now, in light of this question, and I'm thinking about it more more closely. Um, you might be very much limited in what you can do at your workplace. And of course, you don't want to spoil the work workplace atmosphere uh, by introducing religious uh, discussions uh, in, in a time when, you know, religious discussions really uh, are put on the back burner. So you don't want everyone looking at you funny and gossiping in the office about this Muslim who's trying to convert everybody in the workplace. But uh, naturally, you will have opportunities to you know, have maybe a coffee with your workmate uh, or, you know, some people socialize with the workmates uh, outside of the work environment. You, you may have a barbecue together or something like this. So uh, that will present opportunities for you to uh, continue or, or develop a conversation along uh, religious lines. So we need to recognize uh, not only place, but also time and persons. We want to say uh, the right thing uh, at the right time to the right person in the right way. So, so all of these have to be borne in mind. Uh, just because we have a correct idea in our minds and the true belief uh, does not mean we're going to um, say it in every occasion. And uh, it, it doesn't mean we're going to say the same thing to, the same, to every person. We're going to say what is most appropriate to each individual. For example, <coughs> I just mentioned in... <coughs> Excuse me. So I mentioned in the lecture the verse of the Quran about uh, Jesus and his mother. <coughs> I should have had some water nearby. Sorry about that. Uh, so 
you, you're not going to speak uh, about uh, the mother so much to Protestants because Protestants do not give that much uh, uh, credence to Mary, unless you wanted to introduce the logical point that uh, uh, if the mother had uh, died before giving birth to Jesus, alayhi uh, what would that mean logically for the existence uh, of the human uh, Jesus of, of Nazareth? Uh, the Christ would have uh, taken some other, uh, the form of some other human being with a different identity. So you get people to think about things like that. But the idea is that you don't say the same thing to, to everyone because not everyone shares the same uh, background presuppositions. And uh, in any case, not everyone will be equally receptive to this kind of uh, discussion. So you, you, you introduce a philosophical discussion with somebody who is educated, but you speak more in common terms uh, with a person who is not so well educated and so on. Uh, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us to uh, yeah. do it yeah. in the right way. There's definitely wisdom in the time, place, and even the relationship you have with the uh, with the other person. Um, sure. Imam, Imam Khalid, um, another question for you. Um, mm -hmm. And this one might be a loaded question. Uh, so those, you know, that have completed their sentencing, uh, they face several hurdles, hurdles transitioning back into the society, whether that's getting jobs, whether that's, you know, reinstitution of their voting rights. How can Muslims and Islamic centers assist in this transition rather than completely disenfranchising them from the community due to the stigma, you know, incarceration carries, and especially in the Eastern cultures? Yep. That's a very good question. You know, actually, I, I, I honestly believe that before we take on the responsibility uh, of trying to help those who are returning to our communities, uh, that we kind of educate ourselves a little bit before. Because I've worked with a number of returning citizens over the years, and they talk about how the, they refer and make reference to that stigma that you're talking about, that they are so stigmatized that they uh, sense that people are almost, in this slight exaggeration, but some of the brothers are holding their wallets to make sure, their pants pocket to make sure that the person's not going to take something from them. And they're not really, um, they feel that they're not incorporated into the life of the community. So I think that uh, before uh, embrace, uh, it, try, uh, reaching out and trying to bring someone in, um, we need to uh, have some sessions uh, in our masajid, in our Islamic centers, uh, to point out certain things. Because the, the worst thing we could possibly do, in my humble opinion, is to turn someone away uh, from the Muslim community on the outside. Because on the inside, they're very for the most part, they're very uh, tight uh, communities and the relationships are very tight and good. And many of the brothers and sisters come out and find that uh, on the outside, it's, it's not the same way. So I think that first we should try to uh, make sure that we're not the ones who are guilty of almost not sending them back into the streets, but we're not turning them away as they return to the communities. And then I think that uh, we should identify uh, individuals within our community who have that inclination, they have that interest in working with returning citizens. And around that interest, uh, I think we should start developing um, transitional housing in our communities that this should be a part of our work, our community outreach that we're doing, but this is outreach, you know, intra-community outreach where we are providing uh, it, to the best of our ability in an organized fashion, uh, job referrals and making sure that the business owners in our community know that, introduce them uh, to some of our returning citizens so they can find jobs and other things like that and understand that the uh, the strain that returning citizens are under is is really if you haven't engaged with these individuals before it's uh, it's amazing it's, it's, it's disheartening uh, to know the kind of callousness uh, that some of these parole officers and others who are responsible for the supervision once returning citizens get out this kind of 
just crazy stuff. It seems like they are intent on trying to uh, force, not force, but create scenarios where those returning citizens find themselves violating some random um, um, uh, act or something that they may not have even been uh, knowledgeable of before. So I think we do need to create uh, a welcoming environment. We need to create uh, transitional programs because uh, depending on the amount of time that someone has been incarcerated, um, you know, I joke with some of our, our brothers who've come out for long periods of time, and it's, it's many of them uh, things that we just take for granted, like cell phones and you know other developments. I mean, they, they don't have a clue. And so there are a lot of basic needs uh, for community reentry that, that individually or programmatically, I think that we need to be a part of. Zakalah Khair, that was uh, again a very uh, deep, loaded question. So Zakalah, um, I would love to sit here and you know I have a lot of questions for all the speakers, but unfortunately the time doesn't allow me to. So Zakalah Khair, um, all of you, Imam Khalid Greg, Dr. Madsen, Dr. Shabir Ali, for your precious time to spending with us. Um, Insha'Allah. So uh, with that, um, you know, I just wanted to point out another. Uh, brilliant effort that uh, Ikna Gain Peace has been uh, has been doing in, in putting up billboards, mailing postcards, running social media campaigns on the topic of justice and racism. Alhamdulillah, we've had billboards up in cities like Bay Area, Sacramento, Houston, all over the nation. And uh, you know, with the with the message that really pertains to the time and needs of this current society and the the social issues. So I would really encourage uh, everyone to take some time and donate. Um, financially and your time in terms of volunteering. Um, so with that, uh, I will pass uh, this on to the next moderator for the next session. Jazakallahu khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.